and these witnesses here in Revelation are just like the ones that the Holy Spirit seals and secures all the rest of us at salvation. Everybody's saved the same way, okay? You can't be saved unless God does a supernatural work inside of us. And that supernatural work inside of us involves him marking us. And that marking in the Old Testament, he's portraying with this pen mark. In the New Testament, it's the word you can look up in Logos that, that speaks of a seal that you put on a product to say it's genuine, it's authentic, and it belongs to me. And that's what God does. Uh, let me read to you 2 Corinthians chapter 1. The saints, remember, those, those people struggling so much that he calls saints. He says um, in, uh, whoop, I'm sorry, it's 2 Corinthians. Did I say 1 Corinthians? No, it's 2 Corinthians. I was going to say it's 2 Corinthians, not 1 Corinthians. Uh, verse 22. Um, I'll, I'll start back in verse 21. Now, he who establishes us with you in Christ and has a, a anointed us is God, who also has sealed us. So he's established us, anointed us, sealed us, and given us the spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. Wow. God seals all of his servants. Now, wait a minute. Remember this area? I told you last week, got more more letters written to this area than any other place in history of the Bible. Twelve epistles were written to this area. One of them is Ephesians, and remember Ephesus. And look what it says in Ephesians 4.30 about people who are sealed by the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 4.30, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Don't grieve the sealer. Okay, let's talk about that. Beware of ever grieving the Holy Spirit of God who seals us. That's the short way of putting it. Now I ask you a question. Why do some believers not feel like getting in the Word or sharing the Gospel or doing all the stuff that we're supposed to do at church and at Word of Life and wherever we are? Or worse, why do Christians sometimes not even feel saved? Of all my decades of counseling, the number one counseling event is Christians who come of all ages. I'll never forget uh, one of the most active women at one of the churches I served who was involved in everything. She was synonymous with the church. She came to me. Uh, she, looked, she looked unhealthy. She, she just was trembling and she came and said, I just need to talk to you. And, and I said, yes, and she came in the office and sat down. She said, I have struggled since I was a little girl with never being sure I'm a Christian. And she said, I try harder, I do more. And I said, I can't even keep up with everything you do in the church. She said, yes, but she said, I don't feel saved. It was a wonderful time. I didn't tell her anything she didn't know. I just told her everything she did know. I said, so you think you were saved at one point? Oh, yes, she said, I, but I've lost it. I love the people that have lost their salvation or think they have because you have a starting point. If they lost something, that means they had it at one point. That's what lost means. I lost what I had. And so then you take them to John chapter 10, and Jesus said, nobody can get you out of my hand and you are my sheep and I'm, you're in my fold and I'm holding you and you're triply held. You are with me, with God, and the Spirit is within you. So I went through all that. But there was more. There's always more. The more is right here. Ephesians 4.30 said, the one who makes you feel saved is the one who sealed you and anointed you and established you and that's the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit has feelings. He's a person. And there are two things we can do to him. We can grieve him and we can quench him. And flesh-led living grieves and quenches the Holy Spirit. So what I, I'm going to go through what I went through with this lady. So all of you get to come in on a private counseling you know, session. And I'll show you everything I showed her. Because I said... 
The Bible, not only in, in Revelation 7 where we are, not only in Ezekiel 9 where we were, not only in Ephesians 4.30 where I just showed you, but cover to cover it says that all of us are saved by a regenerating process that only the Holy Spirit can do. And so the question is, are you grieving or worse than grieving, quenching, sabaomai, the Greek word of quench means that you actually douse it. It's like a campfire that you dump a wheelbarrow full of sand on, you know, so it doesn't spread fire. You just drowned it so it's, it's covered up. Did you know Christians grieve and quench the Holy Spirit of God? How? By flesh-led living. So I asked this lady, and I'm asking every one of you today, are you spirit-led or flesh-led? And how can we know? I'm glad you asked. How can we know? Here's the contrast in Galatians 5. The spirit-led life has a bunch of attitudes. These attitudes just flow out of a spirit-led life. There's love coming out that, that just you don't even know where it's coming from. It's the Holy Spirit. There's joy. And like just not enough joy, but it flows out of us. There's peacefulness. A long suffering. I mean, you're about the most patient person anybody's met. And there's kindness and goodness and faithfulness. Those are attitudes that the Holy Spirit always produces when he's present. Unless he's grieved or quenched. And then there are actions. I mean, we have this voracious hunger for the word. Nobody has to even tell us. I mean, we actually are looking forward to it. And it's like, if we can find five minutes, it's just like, uh, I noticed uh, when Bonnie and I travel, like on public transportation, any part of the world, as soon as the people get in to the subway, boom, you know, they're right back to either playing or editing or texting or they came in connected with their earbuds. They're, they have a hunger for consuming stuff. If you're full of spirit, you want to consume the word. You want to boldly witness. You're a generous giver. You don't say, oh, I don't have any money. I don't earn enough money. You say, how much can I give from whatever I have? And, and there's personal discipline. Now that's opposed to, see, look, look at Galatians. It's just for Ephesians. Galatians chapter 5, how it's set up. Uh, verse 16, this I say then, walk in the spirit, and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh, verse 16. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh. These are contrary to one another, so you cannot do the things that you wish. But, Paul said in verse 18, if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are, and there are 17 sins. And eight of them are interpersonal irritations with other people. They're Interpersonal conflicts are evidences of the flesh. And then there are the fruit of the Spirit. It's singular, but nine of them are listed. So in other words, it's a package. The fruit of the Spirit is love that emanates these other characteristics. And so let's talk about the flesh-led life. Attitudes, a flesh-led person is angry easily, wrathful, anxious, fearful, lustful. They're always thinking of what they want and how they can get it. They're selfish. They're easily irritated, and they get bitter, like, Murr. Their actions, I mean, to preserve their image, they'll lie, they'll take, they think other people don't, I need it more, I deserve it. They're immoral, they're lazy, they're sarcastic, they're erratic in their life, they're just like, you know, bouncing all over. They're restless. You know, it says the wicked are like the restless sea. A Christian that's not walking with the Lord is restless. They just got to go and do something. They just got to be listening or playing. They just are restless. I mean, they don't want to be still and know God. They're just restless and self-focused. Okay, what's the spirit-led uh, filled life? When I'm filled and led and controlled by the spirit, these attitudes and actions and emotions are revealed. I have peace and joy and hope and love, boldness, holiness, passion, sensitivity, self-sacrificing, hunger for the word, and I hate sin. That's what happens. The instant of our salvation. That's what God starts radiating out when he gives us that new heart. He's just going, woo, 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 you know. It's amazing. That's what the Holy Spirit does when he's in me. But when I'm filled and led and controlled by my flesh, which I was born with, which doesn't go away my entire life, wouldn't it be nice if we could crucify the flesh and walk away and it stayed on the cross, you know? Well, it does stay on the cross, but 
It goes with us, you know, and we still deal with this flesh. And these attitudes and actions and emotions are revealed when the flesh is running. I'm anxious. That's why Jesus said, why are you so anxious? Your, your flesh, your body is trying to make you anxious, but by the way, you know what anxiety is? Anxiety means you're really good at meditating. You're just meditating on the wrong thing. An anxious person is meditating on their problems rather than on the, the promises of God. And so all you need for a, and by the way, that's one of the things we discovered with this lady, that she was grieving the Holy Spirit because she was so anxious. You could see it in her face. You could see it, you know, she just anxious, you know. Oh, that. And, and she had her meditator pointed the wrong way. It was pointed at all, this, all these problems. And it was so sweet. By the way, I still one of the people I still hear from because she's still, she's become on staff at that church where I serve, and, and now she's the one that's running, uh, you know, some of the ministries and some of the updates come, and I, I remember distinctly the day that her meditator stopped pointing this way, and she started saying, wow. She said, you know what, you exactly are describing me. I am focused on the wrong things. And she just, she didn't even need me. She just read the Bible and realized that she was focused on her fears and selfishness and she became lethargic. She wasn't interested in the word. She had no passion for the lost. She was irritable with her family and she was bitter and moody. See, our emotions betray who's leading us, either the Holy Spirit or our fallen flesh. You know what, this is great. This is why Hebrews 10 says we're supposed to all be helping one another because a lot of people that have their their focus the wrong place don't even know it. They just are, that's their whole world. And they need people around them saying, hey, what are you doing? Uh, Did you know that's one of the blessings of being married? My wonderful wife, do you know what one of the many things she does for me? She'll come behind me and listen to me sharing, we'll be talking, she'll stand behind me and put her hands on my shoulder and say, honey, are you believing the truth? Is that believing the truth of God? And I go, well, it, it's true to me. She said, oh, come on, don't give me. She said, are you believing the truth? It says, set your mind on things above where Christ is. And it says, whatever things are true, honest, just, pure, lovely, and good report, think on those things. She said, and what you're thinking about isn't. And she challenges me to repoint you know, my attention on, on the things I should. So our emotions betray who's leading us, the Holy Spirit or the fallen flesh. So a spirit-led mind, described in Romans 7, Galatians 5, Ephesians 5, and Colossians 3, is ruled by spiritual emotions, love, joy, peace, gentleness, kindness, patience, boldness, long-suffering, leading to, see, remember, it's the truth that I embrace in my spirit and it leads to my body. By the way, how does God describe us? And I pray your whole spirit, soul, and body, 1 Thessalonians 5.23. When God looks at us, he says, you're a spirit who has a soul encased in a body. Do you know how we talk about ourselves? I never hear anybody saying, well, I'm going to spirit, soul, and body. No, they go, I'm body, soul, and spirit. What's our primary orientation? Body, soul, which is emotion, spirit, which is the part of God that dwells within us. We are, we are disoriented, and we need a reorientation to have spirit-ruled emotions which lead to the body surrendering and denying ungodliness, avoiding sin, focusing on God and serving. The flesh-led life, it isn't driven by the spirit, it's driven by the body. And over here, the flesh-driven body is restless and undisciplined, this is the way we were born. And, and appetite-driven and lust-filled and never satisfied and defeated by sins. And that leads to emotions that are volatile and lethargic and anxious and angry and troubled and in, distracted and impure. And it leads to a spirit-quenched mind. That means a Christian who has no stability, no boldness, no insights into the Word, no hunger for the Word, no joy, aimless, no confidence, and feeling empty all the time. Wow. Wow. 